Blog Talk Radio. Thank you for joining us on today's interview for the Innovation in Myeloma series on M Patient Radio. We are absolutely delighted for today's interview with Dr. Robert A. Kyle. For over 60 years, Dr. Kyle has led the way in myeloma research and was the pioneer that defined and determined both the term MGUS in 1978 and smoldering myeloma with one of his star students in 1980. His groundbreaking work changed the way that smoldering myeloma was diagnosed and treated. He founded the Mayo Clinic's Myeloma Amyloidosis and Disoproteinemia Clinic. He founded a special protein laboratory and began collecting and recording data for patients with monoclonal plasma cell disorders. He's written 890 peer-reviewed articles and over 1,200 abstracts. He has received the top two awards in hematology, one from the American Society of Clinical Oncology and one from the American Society of Hematology. They are the highest honors bestowed by these two groups, and he is the only person to have received both. Dr. Kyle is a director and member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the International Myeloma Foundation. He's been the chairman of the Myeloma Committee for the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, the Secretary General of the International Society of Hematology Inter-American Division, and a member of the editorial board of of the journal Leukemia. The International Myeloma Foundation has created a Robert A. Kyle Lifetime Achievement Award to honor the physician who most exemplifies a singular dedication to and compassion for myeloma patients and the treatment of their disease. His research continues at the Mayo Clinic today. A hearty welcome to you, Dr. Kyle. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, my apologies. Thank you for joining us. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dr. Kyle, can you share with us your early work in myeloma therapy? You have, of anyone, you are the by far the best person to give us context around innovation in myeloma. All right. Uh, I'm glad to, and if I get uh, into too much detail, uh, please uh, uh, ask me to move along. The history of treatment for multiple myeloma is relatively short. At uh, the end of World War II, in the mid-1940s, there was absolutely no treatment available for multiple myeloma except for radiation therapy, which uh, was given for localized bone pain. As you can imagine, this was not Uh, very effective because multiple myeloma is a systemic disease. In 1947, Dr. Uh, 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 Nels Allwall from Sweden introduced a drug called urethane, and he reported that two patients given this drug had a decrease in their protein abnormality as well as a decrease in plasma cells. And so for the next 15 years, urethane was the only drug that was available for this disease. There were occasional patients who responded, but then in the early 60s, a randomized prospective trial was reported This was one in which 80-some patients with multiple myeloma were randomized to receive urethane, the active drug, or a placebo. And in this study, the placebo drug was cola syrup. When the data was analyzed, it was found that the survival of patients who received the urethane drug was no better than the placebo. In fact, it was just a shade uh, worse. And furthermore, the patients who received the 
placebo, the cola syrup, did not report any nausea, vomiting, constipation, or diarrhea, nor did they develop any lowering of their blood counts, all of which were side effects seen with urethane. Then, in uh, the late 50s, in fact, 1958, as I recall, Professor Bloken from Russia described a, du- a drug that he called sarcolysin, L-sarcolysin. This drug is known today to many of you as malphalan or alkaran. It's an alkylating agent that uh, has an effect against the proliferating plasma cells in multiple myeloma. This, uh, I might add, was uh, reported at the height of the Cold War in 1958, and it took a couple of years for the uh, idea or the drug to permeate to the West, and in 1960, Uh, plus or minus a year, uh, Dr. Uh, David Galton at uh, the Royal Marsden Hospital in London uh, treated patients with malphalan and reported that it was active. Then, a couple of years later, it appeared in the United States. Uh, The head of medicine at MD Anderson in Houston Uh, received uh, uh, the drug and uh, was uh, interested in uh, testing it to see if it did indeed work. Uh, And he had myeloma? He used it for myeloma? Yes, we're coming Mm -hmm. to that. Uh, uh, He used it uh, or wanted to use it in multiple myeloma. And there was a young man... Uh, Danny Bergsagel, who was a relatively recent addition to the staff at MD Anderson. And uh, the chairman said, Dr. Bergsagel, I'd like to have you uh, study this drug. Dr. Bergsagel was a uh, Canadian and had gone to the University of Oxford to study and studied actually clotting and coagulation diseases of hematology. And uh, when he looked around for a job, apparently there wasn't one in Canada that was to his liking, so he accepted the position at MD Anderson, and uh, he told his chief that, look, uh, I don't know anything about multiple myeloma, and furthermore, I'm not really interested in it. I'm actually interested in the coagulation of blood, in the clotting and bleeding, And in fact, uh, uh, that's kind of a subspecialty of hematology, and those people are referred to as, quote, clotters, quote. Well, uh, at that time, uh, chairman of departments and division had, I think, uh, considerably more uh, power than they do today, and he said to Dr. Bergsagel, I want you to study this drug. Dr. Bergsegel took a deep breath and did so, and then uh, reported that eight of the 24 patients that he treated had a good response. And uh, with that uh, uh, finding, which was published in uh, 1962 or 63, as I recall, uh, Dr. Bergsegel's life was changed. A few years later, he was recruited to the uh, University of Toronto, and he uh, uh, kept working in the field of myeloma for the rest of his professional life, during which time he became the leader for myeloma for all of Canada. And uh, uh, again, uh, I always uh, joked with him that uh, he forgot all about clotting after he had uh, uh, recognize the value of uh, urethane. A more interesting topic. Yes, well, uh, it's kind of strange the way things work out. And uh, 
the point I want to make with the urethane study, this randomized study, is is that it had been used for more than a dozen years, and people had seen occasional responses and uh, uh, continued to use it because there wasn't anything else except one other drug called stilbamidine, and that was extremely toxic and nobody used it. In any event, uh, uh, malphalan became the favorite drug for the treatment of multiple myeloma. There was another that came along in the uh, mid-60s for myeloma, and that was cyclophosphamide or cytoxin. And following this, uh, various combinations of alkylating agents were were used along with prednisone for the treatment of myeloma. These, uh, there were a great variety of combinations. There were occasional new alkylating agents and other drugs that were introduced for the treatment. But to make a long story short, uh, there was a, uh, a meta-analysis which is a fancy term for a situation in which a uh, epidemiologist takes the results of a variety of studies uh, reporting on a drug and then puts them all together and comes up with a conclusion. And the conclusion was, with over 5,000 patients, that uh, the survival of patients with multiple myeloma was no better with the combination of alkylating agents compared to that of melphalan and prednisone alone. And uh, uh, as you can see, over this period of time, not much happened. Uh, there were two things, however. Uh, the first was uh, the uh, use of autologous stem cell transplants. This was introduced in the early 80s by a fellow named Tim McElwain, who was also at the Royal Marsden Hospital in, uh, in London, or the area of London. And uh, this, however, as you can imagine, was a uh, toxic uh, approach, and uh, even though there were patients who responded and had good responses, there were considerable side effects and a difficulty in uh, managing uh, this. In any event, uh, as I recall, Ms. Uh, Altram, you asked uh, me to say a little bit about how I became involved in the field of uh, myeloma. Correct? Yes, I think I think I would love to hear how you started your myeloma research. Well, uh, it was uh, kind of by accident in a way. Uh, I uh, was interested in hematology. I, I had taken my uh, my residency at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. That would be a residency in internal medicine. And during the time in internal medicine, the three-year training program, one uh, was expected to spend six months in a laboratory to uh, do a project and to write a uh, thesis, actually, and uh, uh, take a written examination for a master's degree in medicine and then to defend one's thesis in Minneapolis at the University of Minnesota. Well, uh, the options at uh, the Mayo Clinic for the resident at that time was pathology in which one would do uh, autopsies basically for the six-month period and write up a project. The second was physiology, and at that time, cardiovascular physiology was the major uh, uh, activity because this was just when uh, 
heart surgery uh, was uh, open heart surgery was being started. And the third option was hematology. Uh, I might add with the physiology, uh, the major aspect of that was cardiac or heart uh, 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 catheterization. And uh, during that six to nine month period, the resident, the fellow, was catheterized with a catheter going up uh, from the uh, femoral area up to the heart. And uh, that didn't seem like a very uh, uh, interesting sort of thing to me. <laughs> and the third option was hematology. And uh, I uh, uh, felt that I knew less about hematology than anything else in uh, internal medicine. And uh, what I would do is to take the six-month uh, uh, training in, uh, in hematology, and during that time, and this was all laboratory-based, and during that time, one would learn how to read uh, peripheral blood smears, uh, uh, bone marrow aspirates, and that sort of thing. And uh, what I would do is uh, when I finished, I'd go to California and open my uh, practice, and I would be able to read uh, bone marrows, whereas the next internist uh, would not be able to give me a leg up. Well, uh, I uh, found that I really enjoyed hematology, and uh, I... Uh, uh, wrote a project on uh, acquired hemolytic anemia and uh, made uh, two observations. One, that these patients, by and large, had a positive Coombs test. And the second point was that, uh, uh, that you could treat these patient, patients with cortisone, uh, that is the precursor of prednisone, and many of those patients benefited and at that time, I could read uh, German, and uh, in my uh, uh, studies, I found an article in German, and uh, this had been published 50 years before, in 1906. That's and amazing. The, yes, and the writer of that had made exactly the same observation I had, is that these patients with hemolytic anemia uh, did better in general than patients with anemia due to a packed bone marrow. The only thing I had done is to say that they had a positive Coombs test, but the Coombs test hadn't been described until 1950 or so, and cortisone had not been discovered and used until 1948. So it kind of took a little wind out of my sails that uh, uh, this uh, fellow, 50 years before me, had the same idea. And uh, this, uh, I think, is a very important thing for, one, for young physicians to realize, and for everyone, and that is the physicians and scientists of uh, yesteryear were just as bright, just as able as any physician today. And uh, we sometimes, with our sophisticated knowledge, we just take a lot of the information that we are given for granted. And uh, if we had to start out like they did a couple hundred years ago, we wouldn't uh, do nearly as well as many of them. So I uh, uh, spent my six months in the laboratory, and then I realized that, gee, I didn't know anything about clinical hematology, and uh, the field was uh, becoming very interesting to me. So I uh, took the... Uh, hematology, clinical hematology hospital uh, rotation for three months. And during that time, two things happened that changed my life. The first was is that I saw an electrophoretic pattern. And uh, many of you with multiple myeloma know 
that that electrophoretic pattern shows a peak or a spike and that this represents the monoclonal protein or the abnormal protein in the blood and is very important because that's one of the features that we follow to see whether you are responding to therapy or whether uh, you are not. In uh, any event, uh, I asked the uh, uh, physician who was running the service at the time uh, what what this funny-looking pattern was, because uh, I'd never seen one before. And he said, well, we don't know much about it. It's a new test. Uh, why don't you look into it? And so it had been done at the Mayo Clinic for about three years before that time, so I uh, reviewed all of the records. There were over 6,000 of them, and uh, came to the conclusion that if a patient had a peak uh, in which the height of the peak was greater than the width of that peak or spike at midline, if it were greater than four to one, then this patient very likely had multiple myeloma or Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia or amyloidosis. And uh, uh, so that started me on uh, the road in this area. And then on that same hospital service came a woman a 48 or 9-year-old woman, as I recall, from Cincinnati who had developed uh, back pain several months before and also fatigue. And she came to the Mayo Clinic because uh, no diagnosis had been made at home. And uh, uh, her physician saw her and uh, examined her and found that her skin was uh, a little peculiar, a little thickened, and he thought that she might well have scleroderma, which is a uh, uncommon uh, uh, rheumatologic disease uh, that uh, uh, involves thickening of the skin, among other things. And so he continued uh, uh, the evaluation, found that the patient was anemic, and then, with the anemia and the back pain, ordered a serum protein electrophoretic pattern, and the patient had a spike, and this, of course, led to uh, uh, a bone marrow examination, which showed evidence of multiple myeloma. And so the patient was uh, hospitalized, believe it or not, all patients who received radiation therapy at that time were put in the hospital and given the treatment, and I was the resident on duty that night, and uh, as I was going through her chart, I noted that she had seen dermatology, and what does a dermatologist do when he or she sees a patient with a peculiar skin lesion? Well, they'd take a biopsy. And uh, just the day that she was admitted to the hospital, the biopsy report came back, and the biopsy said that amyloid was present. Now, I had... Uh, now, this is a, amyloid uh, is a buildup of protein, or do you want to describe exactly yeah, what that is? What amyloid is, well, I didn't know what it was, be, uh, except that I could remember back to pathology in medical school. And I remember, look, the, we were, we saw under the microscope a uh, glassy-like material that showed no cellular uh, detail or anything, and it was uh, considered to be an inert uh, substance and that deposited in organs and could be very serious. In fact, at that time, tuberculosis was a major problem. And uh, uh, while I was interning, I did see patients who had uh, 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 tuberculosis. I spent a period of time at the Chicago Municipal Tuberculosis Sanitarium in which there were hundreds of patients with the disease, and there were a number of them 
who developed secondary amyloid. But that's all I knew about it. I had never seen, or I I suppose more correctly, had never recognized a patient with primary amyloidosis, that is the type associated with myeloma, during four years of medical school, a year of internship, uh, three years of residency or fellowship at the Mayo Clinic, and I also, in the middle of my uh, uh, fellowship, was drafted into the Air Force and spent uh, two years in a 400-bed hospital seeing a lot of patients, and I had never recognized a case before. And so I uh, decided to uh, go to the Mayo Clinic records and uh, was able to find uh, 80 or 81 patients with uh, primary amyloidosis, that is, amyloidosis that occurred without any particular cause. And as I reviewed and studied these 81 patients, I uh, found that a number of these patients actually did have multiple myeloma, and in fact, all of these patients had uh, abnormal plasma cells in the bone marrow, and many of them had a spike in the serum protein electrophoretic pattern. So that fit together with the electrophoretic pattern and with these two studies, uh, uh, you can look back now and you see the one with the uh, uh, with the electrophoresis and the four to one spike that looks pretty uh, uh, amateurish today. But at that time, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association (JAMA) uh, saw fit to publish it, and uh, the uh, uh, paper that I wrote on uh, amyloidosis was published in. Uh, 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 one of the leading internal medicine articles, or leading medical journals of the day. And so uh, these were, as I said, uh, uh, published, uh, uh, and it was not until 1961 that Dr. Waldenstrom uh, introduced the terms monoclonal uh, proteins and polyclonal proteins. And, and this and is an absolutely fundamental finding. I'm sorry? Oh, this and this finding that you had was before that. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Today, it's just obvious. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. knows that a monoclonal protein is one that is produced by plasma cells and can be malignant, such as multiple myeloma or uh, AL amyloidosis, that is primary amyloidosis, uh, and uh, uh, is very serious or potentially serious, whereas patients who have a polyclonal increase in immunoglobulins have a broad-based uh, increase in gamma globulin instead of the spike. And uh, this broad-based uh, 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 process is an inflammatory or reactive uh, response of, uh, to, of plasma cells to the stimulus. And, today, and the most common causes of a polyclonal increase in immunoglobulins, IgG, IgA, IgM, is uh, uh, chron chronic liver disease or uh, rheumatic diseases like uh, 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 rheumatoid arthritis and, uh, uh, and uh, related uh, rheumatologic uh, diseases. So this was an absolutely fundamental uh, observation that he made and mm. is one that is extremely important today. Now, he's the person, obviously, who described Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia in 1944. And, of course, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia was not a new disease that occurred at that time. Prior to that time, 
It uh, uh, was called a lymphoma or in some instances may have been mixed in with patients with multiple myeloma. Today that just seems like, gee whiz, uh, can't anyone tell the difference? But at that time, uh, it was not uh, really practically po- uh, possible to uh, to uh, do so. And so, in a nutshell, I have uh, uh, kept uh, going in myeloma and uh, amyloidosis and macroglobulinemia, and uh, obviously still haven't uh, figured it out. I think that things are moving along pretty quickly here, and maybe I should just uh, uh, advance quickly to uh, the novel agents. Yes, uh, please. These... Beg your pardon? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, will do. And so in about 1998, uh, a... Uh, uh, a patient. In fact, uh, I had seen him seven or eight years before. He was a 35-year-old cardiologist from New York City, and uh, I had put him on a combination of alkylating agents, and he had had some response. And then, as you can imagine, uh, 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 his disease came back, and uh, he made the rounds saw many physicians, had uh, a couple of autologous stem cell transplants, and at this time he was seeing Dr. Barlegi at the University of Arkansas. And his wife uh, said to uh, Dr. Barlegi, what can we do? And Dr. Barlegi threw up his hands and said, we've done everything. He's had everything over these seven or eight years, and there isn't anything else to do. And uh, she was a rather remarkable person and uh, uh, said, uh, there's got to be something. And uh, she was reading and found a drug called endostatin, an anti-angiogenesis drug that uh, might be of benefit for malignancy. This drug was uh, being studied by... uh, uh, by a scientist, uh, Dr. Judah Folkman at uh, at Harvard. Actually, he was the head of surgery, believe it or not, at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, so she called up uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Folkman and uh, said, I, I, I really desperately want to uh, have endostatin for my husband. And Dr. Folkman said, well... Uh, endostatin, endostatin is only in its early phases of development, and it'll be years before it uh, becomes available. But if you're interested in an anti-angiogenesis drug, uh, there is a drug called thalidomide, and that's available at the National Cancer Institute. You have to ask Dr. Barlegi to... Uh, obtain uh, 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 the drug by uh, compassionate uh, usage. And so she talked to him, and Dr. Barlegi then requested the drug from uh, 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 the NCI, and then he treated the patient with it, the uh, cardiologist, and what happened? Unfortunately, nothing, and the cardiologist died a couple of months later of his myeloma. But Dr. Barlegi had another patient who also was refractory to myeloma, and so he treated him with the thalidomide, and this patient had a remarkable response. And to make a long story short, uh, Dr. Barlegi then treated more patients, and a year or so later, uh, Dr. Singal, uh, who was uh, one of uh, Dr. Barlegi's younger colleagues, uh, reported, uh, oh gosh, 80, 80 some cases of of relapsed refractory myeloma, 
and uh, reported that uh, 33 or 34 percent of these patients showed a significant response. And that was remarkable, and that was the beginning of the novel agents. Uh, this was followed in a couple of years by the introduction of Velcade or Bortezomib. Uh, this is a proteasome inhibitor, and that's a drug that was engineered by a uh, fellow, Dr. Julian Adams, a, uh, a uh, chemist, and uh, uh, introduced everyone to the proteasome inhibitors. And then, uh, uh, within a couple of years, came lenalidomide, or Revlimid, which is a, a derivative or analog of thalidomide. And uh, then, now, just this last year, uh, pomalidomide, the third generation uh, immunomodulatory agent, following thalidomide and lenalidomide uh, was introduced and is available now for patients who have had uh, uh, two previous uh, uh, regimens and are now uh, relapsed or refractory. And uh, then also this last year, carfilzomib, which is also a proteasome inhibitor, uh, was introduced as well. So the uh, effect, the prognosis, uh, the outcome in, uh, in multiple myeloma has improved markedly in the last, uh, 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 in the last uh, dozen or 14 years. So uh, we've all been privileged to, uh, to see this and to live through this period of time and we're very, very optimistic about new drugs, new agents, new combinations thereof. Well, the, it's been exceptional, I think, and many in many contributions from patients and and significant from researchers. Um, as yes, you, and as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, at another time we can talk about. MGUS, smoldering multiple myeloma, and uh, how this kind of fits into the whole picture and talk a little bit more about research, uh, the problems with funding, the challenges of clinical trials, and uh, that sort of thing. Well, I have a question because there seem to be a few themes with what you've talked about so far. First, I can see why you're such a great researcher because you have this natural curiosity and you discover something and then it leads you to many other questions. So whether that's going back in history to find out what's already been done and then relating it to what you've what you're working on, like the article that you found that was written in German fifty years earlier, um, to me that shows incredible natural curiosity. Um, that seems to be one of the characteristics of a, a great someone who's going to come up with discoveries, not necessarily by accident, but by by definitive purpose. Well, so, a lot of things are discovered uh, by chance and by accident, and uh, sometimes uh, something has been discovered. And uh, I always uh, worry a little bit about the fact is, could there be something out there that somebody has talked about, some approach, uh, so, uh, some uh, uh, novel sort of approach that uh, <clears throat> was appeared to be a dead end at that time, but now maybe 10, 20, 30 years later uh, with new techniques, new approaches, and so forth, maybe that uh, piece of information, that study, that observation uh, uh, could turn out to be very important today. That is, putting two and two together and ending up with five or six or more. So I think that, mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, curiosity, interest in things is important, and also persistence, too. 
and not one not has leave. to stay mm-hmm. i think uh, uh in a field and keep working away I have a question about that um I know that I'm wondering as you look at the novel therapies and then what is to come do you see some of the uh either serendipitous accidents or the targeted research um will more of the discoveries I guess come from research or will the cure kind of come from these these accidents I know we're all looking for a cure yeah. And and you have the longest view of this, so I'm just wondering if you have any wise words for the rest of us. Well, I don't know of any wise words, but uh, I think that uh, that uh, it's probably a combination of uh, of uh, <clears throat> of uh, quote accident and uh, persistent effort, and I think they go hand in hand. And uh, I think it's important when we see a patient that is a little different, uh, the disease doesn't behave the way uh, you would expect or something or other, to try to figure out, if you can, uh, what uh, what might be uh, going on in that uh, situation. And uh, uh, there are many instances in which Observations are made uh, years before. Uh, thalidomide is a good example. Uh, thalidomide was uh, was reported used in the uh, uh, mid 50s, uh, used uh, for nausea and vomiting of pregnancy and for anxiety. And then the congenital <laughs> abnormalities were recognized. Uh, the horrific. Uh, uh, changes that uh, could occur in the uh, newborn, and uh, uh, the drug uh, was not was abandoned, so to speak. But uh, there are two studies in this country that were done in the early to mid 1960s, in which a group of patients with malignant disease were treated with thalidomide. And there were actually several patients with myeloma, but no benefit was uh, recognized, and so thalidomide was uh, uh, was not considered for the disease until uh, uh, Mrs. W. Uh, uh, insisted on something like this treatment for her husband. Well, hooray for her. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's yes. I think it's wonderful. Um, now, in in talking about discoveries, because I read a book on this that talked about serendipitous discoveries in science and how how that can happen. But I know that I'm from a background in technology, and I know that for that the right environment sorry, uh, in what in technology, and so technology. I know the right uh-huh. and the right environment needs to exist for these new ideas to really thrive. I grew up in Silicon Valley. Uh, where they have um, kind of a combination of a tolerance for risk, educated entrepreneurs, investment capacity, and then very collaborative networks. So for science, what are what is the formula? What are the elements that need to exist for consistent discoveries? Well, uh, that's a very very difficult and challenging question to to answer, but I think. Uh, a couple of uh, things are are very important, and that is uh, uh, funding. Uh, I think we. I, I think it's terrible that uh, research grants to the National Cancer Institute are funded at a level level of about seven percent. That means that 13 of 14 proposals submitted to the National Cancer Institute have to be uh, 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 rejected, not funded. And what this, I think, is going to do in the long run is going to drive the researchers away. Uh, Researchers are PhDs. Uh, 
or MD PhDs. Uh, the uh, uh, all of them have to eat. They have to provide for their family, and uh, the PhD, if they are not able to get extramural funding for their research, are either going to have to go to teaching or to industry, and in industry, uh, and I'm not being critical of injury of industry at all, but in uh, uh, industry, uh, the researcher uh, works on a particular project or a particular idea or something like that, whereas the academic uh, uh, or the Ph.D. in academic uh, 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 research can kind of, quote, follow his or her nose, so to speak. The problem with the uh, MD PhD is that this person too uh, uh, will be driven to practice clinical medicine in order to make a living and will have to leave the bench, leave the laboratory. And so we lose those people. And then I'm afraid that in 15, 20 years, something like that, everybody will look around and say, oh, my gosh, where is all of the medical research? Right. So why isn't it uh, happening? Well, it's disappeared yeah. right. simply because we've had no, uh, we've had a marked limitation of funding and the researchers have to go on. And then it's very difficult to come back in fact, impossible to come back after uh, a decade or more and uh, pick up and uh, and go on. And uh, so we're losing a generation of researchers. Twenty years from now, we'll say, oh, there's a terrible shortage. Uh, uh, the federal government will say, oh, we've got to put money into research. And so they pump in many, many dollars into research, and it could a lot of it could be wasted. And uh, even at that, it takes a dozen years to train a person. I mean, you get your Ph.D. Uh, uh, four, five years sometimes. Then you have to have a postdoc. Uh, uh, many of them get two postdocs and then start out in an academic career. The physician has had uh, uh, four years of college, as has the Ph.D., of course, and then after that is four years of medical school, three years of uh, internal medicine, three or four years of a fellowship, uh, and then uh, a Ph.D., or you can get a M.D., Ph.D. Uh, uh, a number of medical schools have uh, programs in which you obtain both the M.D. and the Ph.D., but that takes seven or eight years at least. So in a nutshell, it takes a long time to mm. train a researcher. I mean, mm. you can't grow right, them on trees. It's a very deep commitment. Yeah, and the other big problem, as I see it, is uh, clinical trials. We put probably no more than 3 or 4% of patients with multiple myeloma in the United States on, on uh, clinical trials. Uh, in uh, Europe, in France, for example, uh, probably 75 to 80 percent of patients with multiple myeloma go on clinical trials. And consequently, over the last decade, the French have led uh, the world in prospective randomized studies and have made some very, very important observations that are valuable to everybody, patient and researcher. And why the big discrepancy? What 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 is France doing that that the U.S. is not doing? 
Well, the first thing is is that uh, 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 there are no oncologists in private practice, number one. Number two, the drugs are not available to anyone, uh, any physician or anything who is in any sort of practice. And uh, there the patient with multiple myeloma uh, is uh, uh, the diagnosis for example, might be made by one's uh, uh, local physician, but then that patient, once the diagnosis is made or even the diagnosis is suspected, is going to be uh, seen by a specialist or a biohematologist who is a uh, in a regional hospital uh, or a district hospital or whatever, and that hospital is linked to a uh, a uh, university hospital, and the university hospitals, there are just two cooperative groups in all of France, and uh, so the patient ends up there. Now, I'm not saying that that's what should be done, uh, because in this country we have many able practicing oncologists who are very, very busy, and to put a patient on a, uh, on a study takes time and effort, and it's more and more difficult to get patients on study. There are many more regulations than there were three or four decades ago, and uh, uh, all of this is, quote, uh, become necessary, and, uh, and it ends up it's protective for patients it's helpful for patients it's helpful all the way around but it is a difficult cumbersome system the IRBs which uh, which uh, protect uh, patients uh, uh, there's a lot of effort a lot of uh, uh, frustration on the part of uh, physicians and researchers and so forth spending a lot of time uh, writing the protocols, getting them approved by various committees and groups, and uh, IRB approval and all of that sort of thing. It's a, it's a difficult process in, in this country. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad, but uh, there has to be regulation, but I'd like to see a little more common sense and less uh, regulation. Mhm. Okay, well I think it's your our conversation's wonderful and I want to continue it. Um I also want to leave time for questions, so I think we might have to split this into two discussions sure. because we have so much that I think that you can help us cover with MGUS and smoldering myeloma, but I think we should save that for another conversation. Um we right. have several caller questions, so let me go ahead. Oh, good. And um, and let people ask those questions. So if you would like to ask a question, you can press 1 on your keypad, and I will say the phone number. And once I say the phone number, if you'd like to um, ask your question, you may go ahead. So the phone number is 653-3926. Okay, go ahead with your question. Hi, Dr. Kalia. Um Thank you, first of all, for taking your time and to explain in depth the, the history of myeloma. Um, you're a true pioneer in this space, and just appreciate your, your commitment um, to this terrible disease. Um, so a couple of things. Um, one, I, I heard, um, uh, I read a, a while back an interview that you did on the Internet, and in the interview, this doctor had found an innovative area that he thought was promising, but then he was ridiculed by his peers, and he dropped it mm-hmm. because. And then, and then later, six, seven, eight years later, it turned on to be kind of a very promising area. Do you remember? I, I don't have the name and the reference, but do you remember that experience? Um, uh, no, but uh, there are examples. Of such a thing, and they go back for years. Uh, 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 for example, uh, 
back 150, 160 years ago, childbed fever was a terrible sort of thing, and women who delivered babies in hospitals had a very significant mortality rate. And there was a <laughs> physician named Semmelweis at the University of uh, Vienna, and uh, he uh, uh, said the doctors should wash their hands uh, before doing deliveries and so forth, and he was ridiculed and, uh, according to some, was uh, ostracized, ridiculed so much that he became uh, uh, mentally unbalanced, and actually he did die in a uh, in an insane asylum at that time. And obviously he's been proven to be correct. Sing the single biggest advancement in medical history, <laughs> washing hands. Well, it's one of them, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I had read up on that story also. I remember that he... Um, had a, two practices. He had one at uh, a labor and delivery hospital, and then one at a research hospital. And he was noticing the differences. But in that, in that, in, in the mortality rate between the, the mothers and the babies between the two areas, that he inability. That you yeah. see, a lot of babies were born in the home, and those pa uh, and and uh, attended by midwives and not mm -hmm. physicians. And the midwife delivered babies. Uh, actually, the mortality rate among those women was much less than when they were seen by physicians who obviously saw patients who had uh, 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 infections and boils and carbuncles and uh, abscesses and all of that sort of thing. Yeah, and, you're absolutely and, right. And the, the mothers would sit outside this his hospital and beg not to go inside, and some would even deliver in their carriages on the outside, so they wouldn't have to go to the the, the killer, the death hospital, and mm -hmm. and so this that that that's a great example. This this knowledge had spread throughout the community about what was working, what wasn't working, but it wasn't yet accepted by the medical community. They were somewhat, you know, um, dragging the their heels on this. It's embarrassing for us. <laughs> <laughs> so there, you had. And I apologize for not having the, the story at my fingertips, but you had mentioned something similar to this in the myeloma field years ago. And this and this still goes on, this this um, fear of embarrassment to, to go and boldly do new things. Where's where's that where's that where's our, where are those next promising areas that are gonna gonna come from of innovation and, and who's gonna do this? Who who are the bold you know um Dr. Edelweisses of our time that will take those risks, those personal risks among their peers to, to, to identify these new research areas that, that will make a difference? Well, uh, I, I don't think it's possible to uh, give a direct answer to that, but I think one of the things that's very important is to attract uh, young people, that is, uh, the young physician, the young Ph.D., and so forth, to uh, stay in the field, particularly uh, we're talking about multiple myeloma now. And in order to do that, those people have to be able to obtain uh, grants and uh, extramural support in that, uh, uh, in that field in order to... Uh, to uh, continue in the field. If there aren't uh, uh, grants uh, and so forth, well, then they'll uh, go on to uh, cardiology or some other uh, uh, field. Uh, uh, and that's one of the concerns I have about, uh, about the funding in, uh, in medicine and in research today. And that's why, for example, I am sure that many of you are familiar with the International Myeloma Foundation yes, and absolutely. the Myeloma Research Foundation, both of which raise mm -hmm. monies for research. And uh, I think that one of the important things there is the grants that are given to younger people who are 
quote, entering the field, so to, uh, so to, uh, so to speak, to uh, get that initial grant and then hopefully to get another and to continue in the field and uh, not have to or not revert to uh, strictly clinical practice or to another field or something like that. I, I think that we need to keep the young people, the young ideas and so forth uh, uh, involved and around and there are so many things that we don't know and we don't understand that uh, there's obviously a lot uh, that can be done if we have the trained people to work in in a field. So let, let's connect the dots for the, us patients and, and caregivers. What can we do to help put identify these young doctors and researchers that you talk about that are going to be taking those, pushing that, what can we do to help support them? Specifically, who do well, we call, where, where can we go, where can we donate? Yeah, well, I think uh, first that uh, you need to uh, uh, make it uh, clear to our legislative bodies that uh, medical research is important. And that's why various groups had have advocacy uh, uh, activities uh, in Washington, and uh, this is one way to get more funds for the National Institutes of Health and specifically for the National Cancer Institute. We've got to make it import uh, make it clear to the re our representatives in Washington, senators too, that, w that the country needs to invest in research for the future. The second thing that uh, we uh, patients can do is to uh, uh, enter uh, uh, prospective, randomized studies and uh, to uh, be uh, willing and able to participate in these uh, in these uh, activities and then thirdly uh, financial contributions to foundations that are uh, effectively working in the field all right. Well, th thank you very much. But I think the big thing is to uh, get through to Congress how important uh, this is and that education is really the future of this country, I think. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, our second caller has a question at 4003656. Okay, go ahead with your question. Yes, doctor, with with so little resources to go around, how can we uh collaborate and make sure we're not duplicating projects? Well, a quote duplicating projects, quote, is hard to define. Uh one thing is is that when a, uh, a discovery or observation is made, uh, maybe this is a fluke. It has to be confirmed. The same is true with randomized studies. Even though they're done carefully with adequate uh, uh, numbers of patients and appropriate statistical approach and so forth, uh, they don't always uh, come up with uh, or always give the correct answer overall. So some things need to be duplicated and uh, looking at it with a little uh, different uh, light. So I don't really think that, uh, quote, uh, uh, and when you come right down to it, even though two individual or two individual groups are working on a particular uh, agent or st 
study or something like that, they oftentimes have a little different approach, and uh, there isn't uh, 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 that much, quote, duplication that that an administrator can say, look, uh, this problem has been solved, and we don't want to do any more research on it. Uh, uh, that, That would be pretty rare. I, I don't know right. if I answered your question uh, satisfactorily or not. Yeah, I, I I see what you're saying. I just I just wonder if even though that you know there, it's good to have independent analyses and separate looks, I wonder if sharing some of that in more real time would help people move forward together faster. I, I just feel like yes. that should be facilitated. Well, yeah, there are uh, efforts uh, currently to. Uh, accumulate large uh, uh, bodies of data from tens of thousands of of patients. And uh, that uh, may well have merit. It certainly needs uh, looking at and so forth because now uh, we're getting larger and larger databases and we're able to... Uh, uh, to uh, uh, Integrate and to uh, and to uh, uh, look at that uh, at that data, and there are many things I am sure that we kind of today take by granted, uh, take for granted, that uh, looking at very very large numbers of patients may shed a different light on this. That is Thank looking you. at uh, say the. Uh, 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 the databases that Medicare has and that sort of thing. Uh, is this uh, drug or regimen of drugs, is it really effective for this disease? Thank, thank you right. for your comment. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, for our final question, uh, we had a someone email in a question that I'd like to ask on her behalf. Her name is Linda, and she had a question with over 60 years of experience in the field of myeloma. How many patients have you seen? Oh, gosh. Uh, uh, I can't really tell you uh, 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 personally how many I've seen. I was alone for many years because when I started uh, uh, this back in the 60s, uh, uh, a hematologist did all types of hematologic diseases, and in fact, uh, 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 when I uh, said that I wanted to establish a laboratory for protein analysis and uh, a clinic for patients with myeloma and so forth, I was uh, uh, criticized because uh, it was too limiting and that one should not uh, should not do that uh, sort of thing. And so we have now uh, become very subspecialized. We have 15 people here in our uh, group who see patients with multiple myeloma and related disorders. So it's becoming uh, more and more complex and more difficult to uh, do so. Getting back to the numbers of patients, we have uh, in our database since 1960, we have uh, about 46 or 7,000 patients with monoclonal uh, protein disorders, and of that group, about uh, 8,200, uh, something like that, 8,200, 8,300 have uh, uh, full blown uh, symptomatic multiple myeloma. Wonderful. Well, By her... far, the larger number of patients are the patients with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, MGUS. And we are going to have to dedicate a whole discussion to that because that's where the fundamental part of your research lies. Well, so... and that's where myeloma begins. Yes. Virtually her... every patient with multiple myeloma had a preceding MGUS has a preceding MGUS. Well, I think it's worthy of an entire discussion. 
So we will have you again, hopefully soon. Um, We thank you so much, Dr. Kyle, for joining us today. We are so grateful for your service. We are grateful for your contributions to the field of myeloma and are very fortunate to have benefited from your life's work and your truly stunning efforts. Well, it all comes down to you, the patients. That's where... That's what's important. We are very grateful. Okay. Well, very good. I hope I didn't go into too much detail there, historically. No. It's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining joining us for another episode of Innovation in Myeloma. Join us next week for our next inpatient radio interview with Dr. Don Benson to discuss his work in immunotherapy. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.